So I get asked many times how I find my guests for the show. And essentially, they're always the authors of a book that has shifted my soul. Um, or an actress who has played a role that has really moved me. Um, or a social entrepreneur whose innovation or passion or change that they're driving just blows my mind. So in this episode, I find a young lady. Now, I was watching The Real Housewives of Lagos, and I was thinking, wow, I mean, this is one of the best shows I've seen on the continent. And so I'm looking to see who's in the end credit. And the name pops up, Portia Kluby. So, of course, I have, you know, to talk to her about this work she's doing in film and television that is so compelling. She's joining me today. Portia, you're welcome to the show. Now, I want to go straight to moments, you know, a pivotal moment that made you or gave us, gave the world this Portia that we're celebrating today. Can you, can you go back and tell us exactly what that moment would be? Um, thank you so much for such a warm welcome. Um, I'm excited to be part of this, Shiro's. I think it's incredibly exciting. Um, to answer your question, I've had so many... <laughs> Um, redefining moments, actually. But I think the most pivotal one is what happened when I was actually very young. I had this big dream of becoming the superstar actress and coming into the big city to study acting. And unfortunately, there was not enough fees for me to continue school. And my mother said, I'm giving you two months to make it work. If not, you'll come back home. And I never wanted to stay back home in the village. I saw myself right in the stars. So I had to make it work in just 60 days. And I think that was pivotal for me because I learned right there and there to go and hustle my way into the industry and say to producers and actors and all these big names that I had been watching credits and sort of studying them to say, I'm here to carry anything from a handbag to taking notes for you, to printing for you. And I think taking that step as young and as brave as I was has actually what has shaped me to who I am today. So I think, you know, the bad news of not being able to continue with varsity became kind of a blessing because it pushed me to go deeper and say to people, let me assist you in your different projects. And from there, I learned from on the ground what to do and how to do it. And I'm here today. So I think, yeah, that was one of the most pivotal changes or moments in my life that sort of defined the journey to where I am today. Wow. Well, Portia, a lot of people would say that, well, I couldn't go to school. I couldn't further my education. So I probably will fall behind. You know, after all, the world is so competitive, we all need to pursue some form of further education. But in your case, is it fair to say that even though you didn't have the chance to further your education or to finish school, it kind of ended up redirecting your journey um, and helping you find steps in a way that perhaps wouldn't have happened? Is it fair to say that? Absolutely. I think I'm one of those people who are always like, if it's a no, it's a redirection. It's not a complete rejection. It means try another alternative. It's not the end of the world. And I think having that mentality from a young age really, really helped me. Because like you're saying, it will be bad news. I will not make it into the world. I will not make it into the industry. I don't have a degree. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what does the future hold? I said, no, I will find my way. And I think I've just always been that person who just doesn't take no very lightly and easily as well. So I've always been a rebel and a rebel can be in a good way and a bad way it's just about how you channel it so yes you are right I am that person who sees no as redirection and an opportunity for me to go cool what else can I do and not give up you know your response kind of intrigues me you know this concept of rejection what would your definition of rejection be Portia 
Um, sure. I think in my line of work, we face a lot of rejection. And I'll say this in inverted commas because certain people will define you differently according to what they see and what they think you are. And I always say what's important is who do you think you are? So I think in my line of work, you know, defining rejection is perhaps, you know, producers closing the door for you or somebody saying, mm, you might not be ready for this role or try this and try that. So I think that has kind of been what I would say is rejection. But because I've learned to say, if this person is closing this door or they feel um, inadequate or not yet ready for a certain particular responsibility or TV show in my life, I need a bit more time. How do I redefine what, what that means for me? So I think that's how I've defined rejection. That rejection is just merely somebody having a different opinion and a different mirror to what you think you are or can do, but it does not change what you think. What must remain important is what do you think you are? And I think if you believe that at the core of who you are and you hold that with you, you will find it easier to navigate the multiple doors that close because there will always be that one door that will open for you. And it's not probably the right one. You just wouldn't see it at that time if you are facing so many no's. So I think that's what I, I deal with in my career quite a lot. Um, being young, being black, being female, and just always pushing for perfection. And it's like, mm, maybe it's a no for us here. And I always respect people's no's to me, but I'll always take rejection as even a bigger motivation to do better. You know, Portia, I'm sure someone watching this episode might wonder, why, why is Anita going on and on about rejection? But sometimes I feel that in a situation where you feel that you're losing it, as you beautifully said, is actually a situation when you should look at the glass half full. There is an opportunity there. So which brings me to the concept of failure. H have you found yourself failing um, and felt like, listen, this is a failure, but it's not going to, you know, perhaps pull me down, bring me down, leave me down, I will be all the better for it? That is a very good question because once again, I've had so many failures and yet so many wins as well. And it really does take a lot of hard work, but I think the biggest one. Um, so when I was very young, I was fortunate enough to be part of an internship that really taught us about the industry. And I was one of the first sort of people to be selected to work for a very, very big broadcaster. And it was a very good dream come true for me. I was in this space. I was just, you know, out of control. And I walked around with the world on my shoulders, a chip on my shoulders. And I thought I was the best thing to ever hit to earth. Then a few years down the line, I got fired. And I remember receiving the email that says, you have two hours to exit the building. Everything fell apart. I lost friends. Family was against me. The industry did not want to touch me because, oh, girl, you've been fired. People's reputations. It just all went sour from there. That was one of the biggest lessons because how do you come back to the industry having, you know, that tainted name to say, oh, that one, that one that was fired, you know, how do you come back from that? And I remember going home for months and, you know, one particular lady who is now an executive producer, an executive producer, a um, radio extraordinaire said to me, I'm doing a TV show, come and work with me. And I said, me? You certainly can't have me on your side. It's going to be bad for your reputation. I'm fired, didn't you hear? And she said, I do not care. I believe in you and your talents. I don't believe in the rumors and what the world has defined you as. You are not your job. You are a vessel and I want you to work with me. And I remember walking with her in the very same building that I walked out of um, having less than two hours to, to exit. And I think that was the biggest failure, but yet the biggest comeback in my life. You know, to be fired from such a position with such glory and credentials and all the hype and everything that comes with it, to being a nobody who's just coming back and starting from scratch. So that was my biggest failure, but yet my biggest comeback into the industry. And I think it taught me to work 10 times harder because I had to prove that what had gotten me fired in inverted commas was not a definition of who I was. Wow, Portia, you've described something that I find a lot of people, male or female, have 
issues grappling with. I mean, when the door is closed, and in your case, they're asking you to leave. When that moment comes, we feel we've lost everything. So I do have to commend you and congratulate you for, for, for that, or for this ability to, to, to look at it as a conquest and to look at it as a win. Which brings me to the concept of Africa. Yep, we're winning. Yes, we're moving. Yes, we're, we, we are, we're getting somewhere. We're doing something. How would you define your Africa, Portia? What is it? Who is it? All of that kind of wonderful stuff. I think my Africa is absolutely beautiful. I would not choose to be anywhere else, to do anything else. And I'm so happy to be part of television shows that allow me to speak about Africa and African people. It, like it is, we are just vibrant people with different cultures and languages, but somehow we all have a way of communicating and we all understand. So I find that fascinating that we have a code. You know, you might be from a different country, a different accent, a different language, but at the core of who we are, we are the same. So my Africa is just a melting pot of different talents and just vibrancy and just culture. And we are so rich, rich in texture, in just soul and character and music and art. It's just vibrant. And I think that's the Africa I'm part of. That's the Africa I want to tell stories for. We'll be back after this with Portia Klubi. The world of Anita Erskine Shiro's gets more exciting by the minute. I mean, I meet all these women, both online and in person. When we go around the world, we call it Anita Erskine Shiro's Globally Speaking. And whenever you find us one-on-one, -on -one, of course, it's a conversation worth having. But whatever it is, don't forget to subscribe to Anita Erskine Network on YouTube. Click on that bell button so that you can get notified whenever there's a new episode of Anita Erskine Shiro's Up and Live. Of course, it's every Thursday at 19 100 hours UTC. Our women are speaking. Are you listening? Portia, you are welcome back. Now, before the break, you were talking to me about your Africa and you were describing it. And I was, you know, I felt like, listen, I, I need to quickly get off, you know, work and go have some fun in this beautiful continent called Africa. Um, but in the same vein, I want to find out from you, how would you, what would you call Africa's women? If you had to describe her, what would your description of the African woman be? I think the African woman is anything that she wants to be. She is bold, she's raw, she is unpredictable, she is hardworking, but you know what? She's also soft. She's also vulnerable. She's also nurturing. You know, that is the kind of African woman I aspire to be, that I resonate with. It's not somebody who's got a formula on how to make it. It's somebody who strives to be the best person they can be every day. Strong Black African women, but strong in the sense of it can also be soft and vulnerable. And I think for me, that is a new definition of an African woman. It's no longer a woman that is strong and suffering and not necessarily taking care of herself, but it's a woman whose cup is full and therefore can also pour onto others. So very, very, that's why I could go on for days just describing an African woman because we are really um, limitless. You know, we are whoever that we want to be. And I feel like the African woman can now be where she wants to be and we can sit at the table you know, we are the table, we are the chairs, we are the deco, we are the tablecloth, we are the spoons, we are everything that we want to be and we can define how our future looks like. We are just strong, vibrant, smart, but yet soft, caring and vulnerable. That's who the African woman is in my definition. Ooh, the African woman is the table. She's everything. But Portia, I mean, you speak with the kind of conviction that makes me so envious of, of who you are. Look at the job that you have. You are in the seat of telling extraordinary stories. How do you use the power of television, the world's strongest, you know, storytelling medium to, I don't know, is the word manipulate? Well, I guess ultimately to tell about Africa's beautiful emergence. 
I think how I try to use the medium called television because it's very powerful, right? We put up these images and these narratives about ourselves and the world gets to see them. So I think what I always try to do is how do I position the African women or African people in the best, most authentic way possible? And I think I always try and do it in all the shows is how do I communicate or how do I become a vessel to channel what is really true to us? Not in a way that sensationalizes us or to get ratings and all these sorts of things, but is this the honest reflection of this person and this environment? And if the answer is yes, then I want to be a part of that. And I think I like to use television to show the world that we are not what other people define us to be or other countries or other territories, but we are what we say we are. And through this show, watch how this woman, for example, moves from point A to B in her own authentic way. So that when you look at Africa, you look at it from how we want to be defined and not how sort of maybe the media or whatever else wants to portray us. So I think I try and use television as a tool to show Africa in its most beautiful and authentic light as possible. And what would you be celebrating about Africa right now, Portia? I think the biggest thing that I'm celebrating is the fact that it's Africa to the world. I feel like we're at a point where, yes, we can have influences from other countries and other you know, parts of the world, but Africa is at the top and we are setting an example of what it is to be ourselves and have other people learning from us. And I think I said that because, you know, back in the days when we were younger, we sort of copied a certain culture, a certain country, not sure who we are, should we behave in this way? We mimic other cultures because it's a bit of, you know, we are ashamed to be African, we're ashamed to be who we are. Now it's like Africa has arrived. We celebrate our own music, our own art, our own people. And other people are starting to be like, hey, hey, maybe we can learn um, one or two things from the Africans. So I am celebrating that Africa is on top of the world right now and celebrating the fact that we're independent enough to create work and do work for ourselves. That is, I think, what I'm most celebrating about Africa. Wow. Portia, if I could say your authenticity is, it's addictive. You know, you are so transparent and raw and real and energetic and true uh, to yourself, to the continent, to the, your storytelling. In all the life and in all the living that you've had and continue to have, do you have life lessons that you say, you know what, Anita, this I will live with for the rest of my life? Do you have a life lesson or two that you can share with us? Sure. Um, some of them might be cliche, but they are so true. I think the first, and not even the first, because there's just so many, but I think what I will share is, you know when people say believe in yourself? It is really, really true. And I think I am proof of that, that you can walk into a room, not to say that degrees and uh, PhDs don't matter. They do, guys, please get an education. What I'm saying is when you are in a position where you don't have that and you really believe in yourself and your dream, you can go really, really far. And I think to add on to that is also understanding and believing that the core of who you are will be the very, very thing that turns your craft into a business. I think I come from a history where I didn't believe in myself. I thought my hair was weird. I'm a plus size black female. Oh no, this is not for me. I don't look the part. I don't act the part. I don't sound the part. And I think when I started changing and saying, okay, but who am I? And defining who I am and carry myself like the person that I want to be, the world around me is actually much more acceptive and much more willing to work with you because you are yourself. And when you are yourself, you can be a vessel. I work a lot with people and story. You can imagine that if you are not sure of who you are, let alone believe in yourself, how can you tell somebody else's story? So it's very important to believe in yourself and believe in your dreams. And I think also I am very grounded in where I come from. Um, my grandmother's teachings, my family teachings, I come from a very spiritual family. So I always ground myself, you know, with my ancestors and prayer. 
And it is really, really true because again, we work with people and stories. It's always, always moving. You have to find a grounding place. Where do you go to look at the mirror and get your strength? Find that and what that is for you. Use it, pour your cup with it so that you, beca- you can become you know, the best version of, of yourself. And I think what I'll also share is always remain teachable. We are vessels. The moment our egos get too big for ourselves and the moment we think we know a lot and we cannot learn any further, I think that's the biggest downfall we have. Always remain teachable. It doesn't matter if you've just done a big movie, a big reality show. Your next one is a little baby that needs to be breastfed and taken care of, treated like that. So always remain teachable. And I think my last one is respect. You have to respect the craft you have to respect the people around you from the lady that cleans to the guy that takes you to your car to the executive producer at the top because you never know who will be in your path and what they may contribute to your growth so respect yourself respect people and always always say and show up as the best person that you can be and that is all that you really need believe in yourself show up as the best person you can be, remain teachable, remain accessible, and just respect yourself and surroundings. And don't forget to pray, 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 pray. (laughs) Portia, so beautifully said. We'll be back after this. The world of Anita Erskine Shiro's gets more exciting by the minute. I mean, I meet all these women, both online and in person. When we go around the world, we call it Anita Erskine Shiro's Globally Speaking. And whenever you find us one-on-one, of course, it's a conversation worth having. But whatever it is, don't forget to subscribe to Anita Erskine Network on YouTube. Click on that bell button so that you can get notified whenever there's a new episode of Anita Erskine Shiro's Up and Live. Of course, it's every Thursday at 19 100 hours UTC. Our women are speaking. Are you listening? Portia, you have done it for me. I mean, you shared such nuggets that I thought about, but I guess I didn't let sink in, you know, having the confidence to believe in yourself, um, defining who you are for your own self and not for anyone else, respecting everyone, praying. Wow. I could go on and on and on. Portia Chloe, I know that you're a busy woman. Thank you so much for joining me on Shiro's and I can't wait to watch more of your content across the continent and around the world. Thank you so much, Anita and the team. This has been absolutely fantastic. I hope I've passed one or two flowers to anybody who is listening. Thank you once again. It's a boss lady thing.